it's about time for us to focus on the adaptive immune response and adaptive system a little. Of course, the system is the one that the students claim is by far the more difficult of the two systems to understand. And of course, this is also the more sophisticated system of the two. The foremost question in our mind is that how the innate cells and innate system interacts with the adaptive system. We earlier said that macrophages and dendritic cells in the peripheral tissues, they will notice and identify the intruding pathogens. They identify pathogens based on the patterns that they have. They just know that a gram-negative bug has entered or a gram-positive bug has entered the body. How do they relay that information to the adaptive system? That's the question that we are pursuing at this point, and I'm going to refer to this diagram, and here I'm showing a peripheral lymph node, and as you see in the diagram, peripheral lymph nodes include afferent lymph vessels and efferent vessels, and within them, we're going to see the B cells and T cells. And of course, the B cells and T cells that are within these lymph nodes are naive until they get to see the antigen that they are destined to see, as we're going to see shortly. So after the pathogen compromises the integrity of the innate system, the dendritic cells, or macrophages, but mostly dendritic cells, identify the pathogen with their pattern recognition receptors, PRRs, and then they get activated. Activated dendritic cells, DC cells, have more phagocytic activity than non-activated ones. What do they do? They digest and process the antigen, and then present the antigen on their MHC2 molecules. Remember, dendritic cells are one of the three antigen processing cells, one of the three APC cells. Who were the other two? The other two were macrophages and B lymphocytes. So, they present the antigen on their MHC2 molecules. They also synthesize and display lymphocytic coactivators. And those are the cytokines, as we're going to see shortly. And then they migrate to the nearby lymph nodes. This is the event that I've marked event number one for you in this diagram. Now, naive B and T cells, more specifically lymphocytes, they have already have arrived at the lymph nodes. How do they arrive at the lymph nodes? They get into the lymph nodes via the so-called endothelial venules, HEVs. And they stay in each lymph node for a while to see if they can encounter the antigen or the epitope that they are designed to identify. So let's call these their antigenic cognates. So the naive B and T cells, this is the event three, they enter via blood, via a special blood vessels that you see them only in secondary lymphoid tissues such as lymph nodes. And practically these are the portal of entry for the naive B and T cells. B or T cells that they have not seen the antigen or the epitope that they are destined to see or identify. Now, if these naive B and T cells do not meet the cognates that they are destined to recognize, they will stay in a particular lymph node for a while 
and then they travel from one lymph node to another, to another, to another throughout the entire lymphoid tissues in the body in search of immortality. I use this term and I say immortality because if they do not encounter the cognate sort of molecules or epitopes, they die after a few days. So they have a short lifespan. However, if they identify the cognate epitope that they have to identify, they can live for a very, very long time and will remember the memory of that antigen. In a sense, and I tell you, some of them may live as long as we live, as long as the individuals uh, live. So for this reason, I say in a rhetorical way that the naive B cells and T cells that they see and meet the love of their lives, which is sort of their cognates, which is the epitopes that they are destined to identify, then they can become immortal. This process, whereby the naive B and T cells enter via HEVs, and if they don't find their cognate antigens, they go to another lymph node, it is known as lymphoid recirculation. And the B and T cells, that they have the habit of jumping and going from one lymph node to the other, they have not met their cognate antigens yet. And they are all naive B and T cells. Now, if B and T cells encounter their cognates on the surface of the antigen presenting dendritic cells, they are then activated and they will live a very long life. Note that the B cells get activated in the germinal centers of the lymph nodes and T cells in the T cell zone of the lymph nodes. I'm going to show better diagrams and I'm going to revisit the structural anatomy of the lymph nodes later. At this point of time, we are looking at the big picture. After activation, T cells proliferate, differentiate. They secrete cytokines, for instance, T helper cells secrete specific cytokines, or this activates the killer functions in some types of the T cells, especially CD8 positive T cells, the so-called cytotoxic T cells. These cells have the ability to knock down a cell, for instance, virally infected in entirety. At the same time, they retain the memory of their cognate antigen. Another important note for you to remember is the fact that B cells are either activated through the activated T cells or, less commonly, by direct contact with the APC cells. Activated B cells also can turn into or produce plasma cells that make antibodies against their cognate antigen. And they will remember that function quite often for a long time. These plasma cells, these are factories for antibody and always one specific antibody against one specific antigen. Activated B and T cells and the antibodies are then released via efferent lymphatics, event number five, via efferent lymphatics, and then via blood reach the damaged tissues. I'm sure the question that you have is, what are these high endothelial venules? And I'm showing one of those in cross section and I'm also showing a glue as a symbol of glycam, and I'm going to be talking about all of these shortly for you. Also, I'm showing in this diagram a more representative 
sort of a structure of a lymph node that it has a medullary region, a paracortical region, and a cortical region. And as we're going to see later, the B cells are seen in the cortical regions of the lymph node and T cells in paracortical region. So let's go through this together. HEVs are specialized vessels found on all secondary lymphoid organs. So a lymph node is a secondary lymphoid organ. So all secondary lymphoid organs, with the exception of the spleen, and we're going to see this later again, and we're going to do the anatomy of it later. So all secondary lymphoid organs, with the exception of spleen, they have HEVs on them. In contrast to the endothelial cells of other vessels, HEVs have a distinct appearance consisting of a cuboidal morphology and various unique receptors that interact with leukocytes and promote lymphocytic attachment and extravasations. HEVs enable naive lymphocytes to move in and out of the lymph nodes from circulatory system. Note that lymphocytes are mobile and circulate continuously between the blood and secondary lymphoid tissues. When naive lymphocytes first enter lymph nodes, they adhere to it. And those glue or glycan that I'm showing is for that purpose. The moment they see those proteins, the glycan, they stop. They cannot go further. They know that here is the place that they have to exit from the bloodstream. So when naive lymphocytes first enter the lymph nodes, they adhere to and then migrate across the HEVs. Transendothelial migration of the lymphocytes depends highly on expression of this important compound or protein known as glycam-1. The generic name for this compound and compounds that play similar role is addressine. Essentially, they address the lymphocytes that come over. This is the right address for exiting from the bloodstream. This molecule, glycam-1, plays an important role in homing the lymphocytes into the lymph nodes, directing them into the lymph nodes. Other well-known addressines are CD34 and MATCAM. MATCAM stands for Mucosal Vascular Addressine Cell Adhesion Molecule. And as you can tell, those are important more submucosal secondary lymphoid tissues, as we're going to see again later. MATCAM is expressed exclusively on mucosal endothelial cells of gut-associated lymphoid tissues. CD34, hematopoietic progenitor cell antigen CD34, is another addressine that in addition to the HAV is also expressed on other endothelial linings. It plays an important role in cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. Knowing the drainage of the lymphatics is very important. The lymph that originates from interstitial sort of environment of the cells ultimately ends up with the bloodstream. However, I want you to know there are two final outlets for the lymph or lymphoid drainage or lymphatic drainage into the bloodstream. The lymph from right upper body drains into the right lymphatic duct and from the rest of the body into the thoracic duct. These two ducts enter circulatory system via the right subclavian veins for the area B and 
the left subclavian vein for the rest of the body. These two left and right subclavians then get into superior vena cava, from superior vena cava to the right atrium, to the right ventricle, to the lung, to the left atrium, left ventricle, to the aorta, and into the entire intravascular system. So that's how the lymphatic drainage happens, and this is a very high yield, sort of clinically oriented anatomy concept for you as well. Naive B and T cells that leave the bone marrow and thymus, the interlymphatics, to encounter and get activated by their cognate antigen that is commonly presented to them by the antigen presenting cells. What is the term that best describes the activated B and T cells? That is, what is the term that describes B and T cells, naive B and T cells, after they encounter their cognate antigens or epitopes? The term is effector cells. After the encounter, B and T cells become effector cells. Effector B cells are also known as plasma cells, and they secrete antibodies. An activated T cells, however, include cytotoxic CD8 positive cells and T helper or CD4 positive T cells, and they carry out cell mediated responses. Note that peripheral lymphoid organs contain a mixture of B and T cells at least in three stages of differentiation. Naive B and naive T cells, effector cells that have been activated by their cognate antigen and are actively involved in eliminating a pathogen, and finally memory cells that may persist for a very, very long time. How do antigen presenting cells determine the lineage of the T cells? Of course, we have a variety of T cells, cytotoxic T cells, CD4 T cells. Now, the APC cells, such as dendritic cells, only identify the patterns of the incoming invaders into the body. How do they pass along that information? in the lymph nodes, in the nearby lymph nodes, to the T cells. And of course, as you can tell, for different types of bugs, we have to develop different types of T cells. For instance, in response to the intracellular viruses, you need to develop or you need to have cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Well, to answer this question, I want you to know this is an extremely high yield sort of diagram for you. I've tried to simplify everything in the diagram for you and to just orient you. On top, I'm showing the skin which is compromised and a bug has entered. And under the skin, I'm showing a dendritic cell. And then I want you to follow the rows of those sort of table, match them together. And of course, I'm also showing a lymph node and within that lymph node, I'm showing naive T cells waiting in there to hear from the DC cells what type of bug has intruded the body. So, again, make sure that follow the lines properly. That's the catch for understanding these plates. For instance, intracellular bacteria, when they are captured or phagocytized by DC cells, they cause changes in DC cells, not only activate them and make them voracious sort of phagocytes, but also induce in the nucleus of DC cells to produce interleukin-2, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interferon gamma. When that DC cell migrates to the lymph nodes from periphery, within the lymph nodes, pass on those factors, those cytokines, onto T cells. And this causes the T cells, naive T cells, to develop into CD4 Th1 cells.
So then I want you to follow those lines with me. Well, as I said, dendritic cells have pattern recognition receptors on them. Only they can identify broad classes of the pathogens, and then they phagocytize them. This is event number one. Interaction of these PRR, pattern recognition receptors, with the surface motifs of pathogens activates the DC cells. They increase the rate of phagocytosis, produce specific cytokines in response, this is important, to the class of the pathogens that they have encountered. These are events that you see in table number two. After migration to lymph node, the DCs now interact with the naive T cells and train them and tell them about the pathogen that they have seen or they have identified in the periphery. This is event number three. Cytokines that are released from DC cells will determine the lineage into which the naive T cells have to evolve to. For instance, alpha and beta interferons promote formation of cytotoxic CD8 positive T lymphocytes. Note that interferon, alpha and beta, drive CD8 cytotoxic T cell formation. Interferon gamma, however, and interleukin 2, they make Th1 cells. Interleukin 4, 5, and 13 make CD4 Th2 lymphocytes. And finally, interleukin 6 and 17 induce formation of CD4 Th17 T lymphocytes. A female patient has a few molluscum contagious on lesions in her groin area. What type of cytokines are produced by dendritic cells in response to this infection and what type of T cells would you expect to be activated by these cytokines? Well, of course, first and foremost, you have to tell me what molluscum contagiosum, what type of bug, what type of pattern, generalized pattern you need to see on this bug. Well, molluscum contagiosum is caused by pox virus. It's a virus. In response to viral infections, dendritic cells produce interferons, alpha and beta. And these cytokines in the lymph nodes convert naive T cells into cytotoxic T cells or CD8 positive T cells, which in turn they cause apoptosis of the virally infected cells. A patient contracts listeriosis after consuming unpasteurized milk and presents with mild fever and diarrhea. What type of cytokines are produced by dendritic cells in response to this infection and what type of T cells are activated by these cytokines? Well, again, you have to know what is the class of the listeria. Is it intra or is it extracellular bacteria? That's what dendritic cells are interested to know or they can recognize. Listeria is a facultative intracellular bacteria. In response to intracellular bacterial infections, as you see in the previous diagram, Dendritic cells produce interferons gamma, interleukin-2, and interleukin-12. These cytokines convert naive T cells into CD4 positive T helper 1 cells. CD4 positive T helper 1 cells. Stimulation by these cytokines causes the Th1 cells to secrete interferon gamma and tumor necrosis factor beta, TNF beta. These cytokines stimulate macrophages to become notorious sort of killers, and they aggressively phagocytize bacteria. At the same time, these cytokines 
recruit other leukocytes to the site of infection. They produce inflammation and they also act on B cells to promote antibody class switching. So what type of cytokines are produced by dendritic cells in response to helminthic infections? And what type of differentiation do they cause in the naive T cells? EC cells make interleukin 4, 5, and 13 that are known as pro-inflammatory cytokines. These cytokines cause formation of CD4 positive Th2 cells and also promote class switching in B cells to produce IgE. And IgE plays an important anti-parasitic role as we're going to see it a little down the road. It's about time to talk a little about the antiviral functions of the interference and as I go through it I'm going to be referring to this diagram for you. The diagram on the left side shows an infected cell and you see the hexagonal viral particles that they have entered into a cell and they have infected the cell. So I want you to refer to this diagram. And the green cell on the right side is a nearby cell to the originally virally infected cell. So interferons are proteins or glycoprotein cytokines that boost the body's defense against viruses, intracellular bacteria, and tumor cells. Lock in this information. Interferons were originally named for their ability to interfere with viral proliferation. After infection, after infection, viruses use the host's energy resources to replicate themselves and spread to other cells. That's event number one. Meanwhile, the presence of viral particles in the cytoplasm of the infected cells promotes transcription of interferon genes in the nucleus of the host cell. This is event number two. And results in formation of interferon messenger RNA. That's event number three. Then the messenger RNA translated into interferon in the cytoplasm of the infected cell and it's released into the blood. This is events four and five together. Cells of the body, they have interferon receptors. Note that INFAR or interferon AR stands for interferon alpha receptor. And I'm showing that in the orange color next to the number five for you. Attachment of interferons to the interferon alpha receptors promotes formation of antiviral messenger RNA in nearby cells. So these proteins, antiviral proteins, now they disrupt the ability of intruding viruses to make their own proteins inside those cells or inhibit or stop the viruses from infecting the nearby cells. And that's event number eight in there. And I'm showing a toll in there to show you that we're going to stop the viruses from entering into the neighboring cells. That's event number seven and eight together. And I'm showing the stop sign so that you know that the viruses cannot enter into the nearby cells. You have heard of interferon, alpha, beta, and gamma. It's a good time right now to compare and contrast these three types of interferons with each other. I want you to know for the simplicity, interferon, alpha, and beta, they have so much structural and functional similarities, but interferon, gamma, 
has a lot more differences with the alpha and beta. Now all interferons are similar to each other because they are cytokines made and released by eukaryotic host cells in response to pathogens and biological inducers. They all bind to specific receptors on the cell surface and induce signals that have anti-inflammatory function. We have divided the interferons by classification into two classes only, type 1 and type 2 class. Interferon alpha and beta are type 1 interferons, and interferon gamma, which is a little different from the other two, is a type 2, essentially interferon. Receptors that interferon alpha and beta act on, sometimes some people call it interferon alpha beta receptors, but again, we don't use the letter B in the abbreviation, so we use interferon A receptor for both of them. However, the type 2s, the interferon gamma, uses interferon gamma receptor. The site of synthesis of interferon alpha and beta is any virally infected cells. However, interferon gamma is produced in natural killer cells, natural killer T cells, and T lymphocytes. Primary functions of interferon alpha and beta both is the fact that they produce viral resistance in neighboring cells, they induce genes for viral DNA destruction, they induce major histocompatibility 1 expression and CD8 positive T cell activation. Interferon gamma. Primary functions of Interferon gamma is signaling the immune system to respond to infections and cancerous outgrowths. Activates macrophages, induces class 2 major histocompatibility complexes. The clinical usages of these three types of interference, however, is important. Clinical use of interferon alpha is for treatment of hairy cell leukemia melanoma, Kaposi sarcoma, hepatitis B and C, and candyloma aquamenata. Where have you heard of this term? You have heard of this term in relation to human papilloma virus. Interferon beta, we use it for treatment of relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis. Interferon gamma, for treatment of chronic granulomatous disease. To just orient you for the first time, we are looking at different types of antibodies. This is a very good summary chart, and I want you to use it as a frame of reference here after. On top, in the first row, I'm showing the five types of antibodies, IgM, IgG, IgA, IgE, and IgD. In the second row, I'm showing the structure of them. Just to know the IgM, which is secreted from the cells, secreted from B cells, that IgM is a pentomere. However, as you're going to see later, the IgM, which is bound to the cells, to the B cells, that one is a monomer. IgG is a monomer, so are IgE and IgD. IgA, when secreted, is secreted in the form of a dimer. So secretory IgA is a dimer, and the two monomers are joined together by a so-called J-chain. And of course, IgM, the pentomere, also has J-chain. Looking at the serum half-life of these in days, just to know, the longest half-life belongs to IgG, about 23 to 25 days. The rest of them are almost similar, 3 to 5 days, to make it simple. When you look at the percentage of the immunoglobulins, by far the most abundant one, 80%, is IgG. And the next two abundant ones are IgM, and IgA. The least abundant, at, at least in the serum 
or plasma is IgE. As we're going to see shortly, almost most reservoir of IgE in the body is joint, is joint to mast cells, and mast cells are in the tissues. They are not in the blood. For that reason, the blood amount of IgE is the lowest. When you look at the size and molecular weight, the IgM, the pentamere of IgM, which you may see in the blood, has 900 kilodalton, which is the heaviest, followed by dimers of IgA 300, and the rest of them are about almost the same size, about 150 kd. The heavy chains that describe the isotype of these antibodies specifically, the heavy chain for IgM is known as mu chain, for IgG V gamma, for IgA alpha, for IgE epsilon, and for IgD delta. Important question for us is the function of these immunoglobulins. One important function is complement fixation. I want you to know that only two immunoglobulins, IgM and IgG, can fix the complements. With regard to opsonization, only two of them can opsonize. As we're going to see later, more in detail, the opsonization function is either direct or indirect. To be more specific, the IgM only has indirect. And as we're going to see later, indirect means that you have to involve complements. However, IgG has both direct and indirect method of opsonization. Means that it can work through complements or directly can cause opsonization without the contribution of the complements. So if they ask you on the exam between the two, IgM and IgG, which one is more potent opsonizer? You're going to say IgG. The other antibodies don't have opsonization function. More specifically to look at the functions of these antibodies, IgM agglutinates bacteria and antigens. It has a very powerful agglutinating function because it is a pentamere. It has actually 10 sites on its surface for binding to the bacteria and causing their agglutination and, if you wish, precipitation. It doesn't exactly mean agglutination, but at least it helps you to understand the concept better. Also, I want you to know that IgM is the initial antibody response of the body. So IgM, M of the IgM, reminds you of the mother. So that would be the first person that goes with the child. So anyhow, that gives you a light mnemonic in there. The monomers of IgM serve as B cell receptors. Very important concept, locking that information. So you see the monomer version of it on B cells. Now, IgM has good complement fixing ability. And again, because it has 10 surface binding sites for antigen, for that reason, it provides a very good complement fixing ability. And for that reason, also as you're going to see later, it is good to have something like IgM to be produced early because it can identify with so many binding sites the bugs in the blood early. I want you to know the IgMs that are on the B cell surfaces, they lack the J chain. So J chain you only see it in secretory form of IgM, and later we see it with IgA. With regard to the IgG, this is the main immunoglobulin for secondary responses to the box. This is by far the most versatile, the most abundant immunoglobulin in the extracellular fluids of the body. Another important evolutionary role of the IgG is the fact that this is the only immunoglobulin that passes through the placenta. So this is the one that protects the fetus. 
Why? Because placenta has FC receptors for IgG. IgG also neutralizes viruses and has the ability to neutralize toxins. With regard to IgA, this isotype provides for mucosal protection. Before I go any further, let me orient you a little. When we are introduced to a particular epitope or antigen for the first time, the very first essentially antibody that body produces, and that's IgM. And each time thereafter that we are introduced to the very same epitope, again, our body produces IgM. And that's the very first one that we produce. And that encounters, let's say, in the blood and in the fluids, in the ECF, the antigens for the first time. However, IgG can always be produced later. And this is major secondary response of the body in the tissues to the very same antigen. And to give you another example, maybe to illustrate the point, suppose a patient for the first time in his or her life gets exposed to E. coli, a particular sort of strain of E. coli. Well, of course, that E. coli produces IgM in a patient and also in long term produces IgG in a patient. But that very same epitope also produces IgA in a patient. So now we have all three types of antibodies, or three isotypes of antibodies, if you wish, to the very, very same type of bug that has first entered into our bodies. Now next time that this bug comes around, if it tries to come through the GI, we already have the IgA version of the antibodies against that bug. If it gets into our blood, we have IgM that is produced always for the first time against it again. I want you to know this important note about IgM. IgM has no memory. IgM has no memory. So the second time the bug comes around, we're going to produce IgM against it as if it is the first time we have seen that bug. And that IgM, with the pentamere sort of arms, it grabs and agglutinates as many E. coli in the blood as it can. Finally, when the bug is in the tissues also, we have that IgG is produced this time much faster and at a much higher rate. And those are the ones that essentially bind to that antigen. So anyhow, the point I'm getting across is that after exposure to any bug, practically our body produces all five isotypes. And this is something that confuses students because they think that we have one or the other. No, it's not true. We have all five types in our body in response to every particular epitopic antigen. But going back to our IgA, this is the version of the antibody that causes mucosal protection. This is the main immunoglobulin in secretions of the body. The secretory piece of it is made in epithelial cells and then it is added to the IgA as the IgA is secreted. IgA does not fix complement unless aggregated. IgE is involved in allergic reactions. It's involved in helminthic protection. Long, long time ago in human history, of course, we would have had a lot more function, as you can guess. This is the least common serum immunoglobulin. I explained it before. Why? Because it binds tightly to FC receptors on basophils and mast cells and it's extracted from the blood. But whenever we are confronted with helminthic sort of diseases, these basophils and mast cells, they are able to unleash tons of these IgEs onto these worms. For IgD, no one knows what this is all about. Of course, this is one of the earlier 
even the globulins that the body makes, this is the second one that it makes, uh, and it's almost always attached, it seems, to the B cells. It's only expressed in naive B cells, and still we don't know much about it. But I'm sure that as the science of immunology develops further, we're going to learn more about it. But it's for now, this is not a high yield concept for your exam. All you need to know are the first four immunoglobulins. Another question of interest to you is that to know that under what conditions these immunoglobulins increase or decrease. When we get to the later part of my book and my immunology, I'm going to be doing the applied and clinically oriented immunology for you. And at that point, I'm going to be covering these conditions that will decrease or increase the levels of these immunoglobulins for you. But for now, to get you oriented, the levels of IgM is increased with any new infection. New infection even to the past infection. By this I mean, if I have had bacteria X five years ago or two months ago, if I'm confronted with bacteria X again, again our body produces IgM. The levels increase in infectious mono, Waldenstrom, macroglobulinemia, and hyper-IgM syndromes. The levels of IgG increase in chronic infections and multiple myeloma. Levels of IgA in Westcott Aldrich, liver cirrhosis, and IgA myeloma. Levels of IgE in Jobs syndrome, type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, interleukin-12 deficiency, Westcott-Aldrich syndrome, and parasitic diseases. The levels of IgM is decreased in A-gamma globulinemia, Westcott-Aldrich, and chronic lymphoblastic leukemia. The levels of IgG is decreased in A-gamma globulinemia, hereditary ataxia telangiectasia, lymphoid aplasia, and chronic lymphoblastic leukemia. The levels of IgA is decreased in selective IgA deficiency, hereditary ataxia telangiectasia, and chronic lymphoblastic leukemia. The levels of IgE is decreased in congenital A gamma globulinemia and selective IgA deficiency. Let us look at the four major functions of the antibodies. And I'm showing the cell membrane and nucleus of the cell membrane, and then I'm showing bugs for you, and then I'm showing the antibodies in red. I want you to know there may be an overlap or similarity of function between agglutination and neutralization. And for that reason, the terms may confuse students, but there are similarities of the function as the diagram explains it for you. By the virtue of neutralization, as you can see only in the diagram, you can orient yourself, the antibodies, the fab region of the antibodies attached to the antigens on the surface of the bugs, they surround, the antibodies surround the bugs. The bugs may get big because of attachment of antibody proteins, so they cannot enter into the cells. So it produces a mass effect in the bacteria. In contrast, when you look at the agglutination, antibodies, one arm of them may attach to one bacteria, the other arm to another bacteria, and in this way they agglutinate the bacteria. Again, they produce mass effect, and therefore the bacteria, because they are too big right now, cannot get into the bodily cells. But anyhow, as you can tell, these two functions are very similar to each other. So the four major, however, functions are opsonization. Sometimes as a mnemonic, I call it oopsonization because marks or targets the pathogens for destruction by phagocytic cells. But anyhow, that's opsonization. Then we have complement fixation. Promotes opsonization 
this function and actually aggressively promotes opsonization or again oopsonization because you coat essentially the bug with C3B as you're going to see later. C3B is sort of very attractive, tasty if you wish, to the phagocytes. Attracts the phagocytes. Phagocytes think, oh, there is ice cream here or there is chocolate here. They now eat the bacteria instead of chocolate. But anyhow, that's an analogy. So, complement fixation promotes opsonization, phagocytosis, and bacterial lysis. The other function that I've shown in those two diagrams on top are aggregation because antibodies block attachment of pathogens to their cellular targets because they produce mass effect on them by surrounding them or joining them together. And the other function, again, similar to aggregation, is neutralization because antibodies neutralize bacteria, viruses, or toxins in one of the two ways that I've shown in the diagrams on top by surrounding them and producing mass effects so that they are not absorbed onto the target cells and two, by causing aggregation and precipitation. Again, as I said earlier, aggregation and neutralization functions have overlapping effects and may happen simultaneously. So let's talk a little about the function of opsonization. In this diagram, actually to be more precise, I'm showing direct opsonization. And we're going to follow this diagram. And this direct opsonization causes phagocytosis of the bacteria. As you can tell by just looking at the diagram, the fab part of the antibodies attached to the bacteria the FC part of the antibody attaches to FC receptor, FCR, that, as I said earlier, all macrophages, dendritic cells, they all have these FC receptors. And when that FC segment of antibody attaches to the FC receptor, now this macrophage gets activated and phagocytizes the bacteria. So opsonization renders pathogens and bacteria to phagocytosis. In this process, the bacteria are coated or marked by the antibody and or complement and become recognizable to the phagocytic cells or macrophages. In this diagram, I'm not showing. I'm showing only direct opsonization. And so essentially complements are not involved in direct opsonization. But later, I'm going to show the diagram for indirect opsonization for you. Now, opsonizing antibodies are IgM and IgG, and they can fix complements at the H2 segment of their heavy chains. Remember, earlier I said that H2 segment of heavy chain has sites for attachment of the complements. The most potent opsonizing antibody is IgG, in particular, IgG1 and IgG3. Antibodies attach to the FC receptors of the macrophages and neutrophils and bridge them to the pathogens or the antigens. Macrophages, monocytes, and neutrophils also have receptors on, again, H2 segment of the Revy chain for C3B or fragment B of the complement 3. Note that in the diagram that you see here, only FC receptors and FC regions of IgGs are depicted. Upon activation of immune complexes, C3B binds to the antibody and then the phagocytes connect via their FC receptors to FC region of the antibody and the conjoint C3B molecules. I'm going to show that diagram shortly for you. That's indirect opsonization. There are, as I said earlier, two types of opsonization, direct and indirect. Both IgG and IgM can perform indirect, but only IgG can perform direct opsonization that you see in this particular diagram. So let's look at the indirect opsonization here. 
Again, I'm showing a macrophage for you, and it has FC receptor, and then I'm showing an antibody, IgG, attached with the two FAB regions, attached to the two antigens on that particular bulk. Now, IgG or IgM attached to the antigens, as I said earlier, both IgG and IgM can participate in indirect opsonization. IgM or IgG can attach to the antigens. In this diagram, the horns of the pathogen. Here is what I want you to remember, which is important. This attachment creates conformational changes in the immunoglobulin, and as a result, the segment 2 of the heavy chain undergoes conformational changes and now it can attach the complement one so as you see in the diagram now complement one has attached to the h2 part c1 attachment proceeds to c1 activation and sequentially cleavage of complement four and complement two into fragments a and b of complement four and complement two and finally, as you see in the diagram, we're going to make fragment B of the complement 3. And I'm showing a candy bar in there to show to you that precipitation or presence of those C3Bs on the box coats the box with candy bar. And I'm just showing you to illustrate the point that makes them palatable. It attracts, that candy attracts the macrophages to that C3B and macrophages are attracted and they internalize the bulk. Another important fact for you to remember is that in the process of complement cleavage, the B segment always stays attached to their chain, whereas the A dissipates into the plasma. So A for away, but B for the body, B stays there, is the core stays there and stays there for the duration of the functions of these complements. Presence of C3B on the surface of the pathogens attracts the macrophages as this fragment of C3 has a potent opsonizing effect. Note that opsin means cuisine and that's why I illustrated that with a candy bar for you in this diagram. In other words, formation of C3B on the surface of pathogens not only attracts macrophages, but also stimulates process of phagocytosis. I already showed you direct opsonization that causes phagocytosis. I'm showing it here from a different angle. Again, I'm showing the antibody attached to the antigens of the bug, and I'm showing the FC receptors on the macrophages for you. So IgG attachment to pathogens makes conformational changes in the FC region, this time, of the antibody. So when the FAB region of the IgG attaches to the antigens, the horns of that bacteria, that causes conformational changes in the FC portion of the antibody. And earlier I said that it also causes conformational changes in H2 region. H2 region binds complement 1. This time I'm looking at it from a different angle. The conformational changes happen in FC portion. Macrophages also have FC receptors and they are attached to the pathogens and attach to the FC segment of the antibody. This sort of attachment means the attachment of the FC portion of antibody to the FC receptors, this attachment, among other things, also activates the macrophages. They become notorious, sort of eaters of the bacteria and can perform phagocytosis. Note that this function is only performed by IgG. Free serum IgG and IgM molecules can bind complements and they can initiate complement cascades and formation of the MAC attack complex. This may potentially cause serious widespread systemic 
inflammatory responses. The question that you're going to ask me is that, why does this not happen in the blood under normal conditions? Very good question. The answer is that the IgG attachment to the pathogens is the phenomenon that makes conformational changes in the H2 region of the FC component. As a result, complements are able to attach to the H2 position of the antibody. This results in selective activation of the complement cascade on the pathogens that are attached to the antibodies.